on this episode of Two Guys, One Coffee Cup. Oh. Nips out. Sun's out. Oh, out. yeah. Oh. Oh, God. Yeah, Let's hot. go. Tough. You hear it? I did what you said. <laughs> So, what's your fucking deal? What's your deal? What kind of deal? I don't know. What I deal? feel like I haven't seen you in fucking forever. That's the deal. So, um, I mean, we saw each other yesterday. So that's we were true. At the range all day. That's well, the, not all day. The first time we've shot together in a minute. It's good to know you still got it. You know, a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. A little seventy yeah. thirty. You know. <laughs> you know, I, I, I've got to get out a little bit more. I'm going to start shooting competitively. I think I am too. I'm going to start either shooting three gun or something along those lines. I haven't necessarily decided yet whether it's like tactical games or three gun something. I don't know. I, I, I missed it. I think my, my deal with it is I was burnt. I was like super burnt on it for like from shooting so much. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was, I was over it. Like, yeah. like I was like, it was, it was, and it was my job. Like, but I was on the range every day for but i think years. what has lacked at least in the civilian side for me is the high level of competition because if you go out there you know arguably a lot of the times i shoot it's playing rso right you mm -hmm. have influencers or people that you're showing machine guns and pistol shooting to and these are people that like a 10 yard shot on an ipsic target center mass is a semi-decent shot for them and mm -hmm. so like you can't necessarily compete because yeah, it's unfair. You've trained your whole life. But like yesterday for context for the listeners, like we went out to like kind of a three gun place, shredded some steel. That, that was a lot of fun. I'm not sure though, if I'm down with like the shotgun, I haven't really done. I love trap and ski. It's one of my yeah, favorite yeah. thing. I just bought three actually new shotguns. We can talk about that later, but I haven't done um, that three gun stuff. So I'm, I'm curious to see how that shotgun plays on the, on the pipe pipe plates. I've never done that before. I've done it. It's Is you just using birdshot or. Yeah, I mean, oh. well, essentially, I think it's it's a little bit different, but I, I I tend to lean a little bit more into I really like pistol, I like the speed of of running, you know, the game. We'll call it with, yeah. with pistols. So you're 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 moving from target station to target station. You've got to figure out exactly where you can sh you know, cut a corner or whatever that might be. I really like that. Uh, I like long distance shooting, so I do like PRS. Yeah, which PRS is a is a ton of fun because you got, you know, your ballistics calculators, you've got yeah. math, you've got gear. I mean, part of this whole thing is like just the gear itself is super fun. You know, well, you can just gear, fully gear out. nerd out on it. Which is cool. Nerd out. Yeah. I don't, I don't think I would do long range PRS. I, I, cause I've, I'm a pistol carbine guy. So I think that the learning curve would be so steep for me. Maybe not because I can shoot, but I don't know, like all the calculations and all that stuff those guys are doing seems hyper technical, but the pistol carbine side, it's like I've trained enough where I feel I could easily fall into that. You just have to get the right setup, which I bought today because why not? Yeah, what'd you buy? Uh, it was I don't I don't never really heard of him, but uh, this gentleman Luke he owns a Sinner Mass down in San Antonio, mm -hmm. and he's been working with me to build some new guns and and put together some crazy shit to kind of troll the tactical industry like I used to. Yeah. Um, but it's an SPC nine, which is kind of like a short barreled rifle, nine mil, mm -hmm. and. It takes those Glock mags too, so oh, you yeah, can run yeah. those forty-five rounders, which is which is gonna be pretty cool. What, was that company that we were shooting yesterday? It was the MDX? Was that the yeah? Yeah, I, I think, think it was MDX. MDX on the mag. It's like a magazine extender f for a Glock mag right. kind of thing, like yeah. forty what forty six five six rounds forty one. Forty one, yeah, forty one. It's like gangster, dude. Seems so gangster. <laughs> I, I was I was just dreaming of of plugging that thing in specifically on my SDI or my Glock and having 41 mags and just being able to run an entire course, like just fucking shoot as fast as you can. I, I really enjoy shooting fast now. Yeah. I'm rusty. So, you know, it's part of the game, part of the game. You got to knock the rust off. That long old Christensen's arm that that gentleman had Ooh. was sick. It's like, it, man, it, it's, it's, I think it was like a 16 inch, that first one. And then yeah. there's, zero recoil with that nine mil i'm sure it's like i don't know 115 grain wherever you're shooting out of there but that thing is just like it's like a fucking pellet gun you like it's, it, it's so fun yeah what's your what's your go-to 
when you go to the range, what's your go-to? What's your what's your favorite gun to shoot that you I, have? Yeah, I have two. So I just, uh, and I'm not just plugging for the sake of plugging, but I built a Sons of Liberty. Oh, okay. Let me- You let, built it? Let me, let me, let me back my <laughs> yeah, stupid yeah. fucking ass up there. Uh, no, Mike built it, yeah. uh, who owns Sons of Liberty Gunworks. I, and I, the tolerances on those things are so sick. So that's the AR. Yeah. But I kind of built it out to be what I like. Because I have, I have two AR platforms that are like, mine i have my one by my bed that's like mm -hmm. a dual mag very similar to i carried in range of time sure. but it's a little heavy it's got the ready mag on there yeah, a lot yeah. of it's 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 a it's a juggernaut of an ar it's meant mm -hmm. to get like okay we're gonna be in a gunfight for a while but i took the sons of liberty and made that kind of like more of a mobility ar platform so it's nice and light super fast and then um i've been shooting uh i'm a, I'm a staccato but i don't shoot it that much i i actually shoot my glock more i had mm -hmm. defcon Who's a yeah, custom yeah. Glock maker in San Antonio? I gotta talk to that guy. I keep fucking forgetting to call him. He's he's so dope. Uh, but he built me. Um, I don't know what's the nomenclature of the the Glock long, whatever the long barreled Glock yeah, in that yeah. mill. He put Steve Ray Vaughn, who's like my favorite guitar player of mm -hmm. all time. So like on the back plate, there's a musical note. It's all like wood, Paul, like engraved um, the the Cerakote on it. Yeah. So it, it custom trigger everything. It's iron sights. That's what I was telling you yesterday. I'm a wacko that doesn't shoot you know red dots, but. Gross. I need to get into it but that those are like my two fucking go-tos that thing 80 yards just like ing, ing, right ing. yeah it's hard to miss with it yeah Would so you, ar glock that's your that's, kind of go-to that's yeah, yeah. I, I haven't changed you know you haven't I, it's, yeah you haven't changed yeah well you know how it is like back in the day when we're fucking you're in afghanistan you know contract and do whatever you're doing I had, I was like, I had the key, keys to the ammo fucking Connex. So, you know, on Fridays, if you want to go shoot, I just cruise out there and I'd, I'd run through three, 4,000 rounds, like aggressive eight hours. And once you've done so much of that, it's like, I think retraining yourself on any other platform also, cause that European grip style and the Glock, it's like, why would I ever switch? Yeah. That, that's a great book for the listeners that are, that are paying attention to this. There, there's just a book called Glock. It's the history of Glock. It's amazing, actually. So it, I'm not going to ruin the story for you because it's it's fascinating and how they how they built it, the evolution, how they penetrated the market here, what was happening in the gun industry at that time, why they were successful. It's really interesting. Like the whole thing is, is it's fascinating. It's easy read too. Yeah, and I, I've kind of on the internet seen Glock get a little hate, but the way I look at Glock, it's the AK-47 of and and Brandon Herrera is not rubbing off on me that much that I'm an AK guy. No way. No way. But the Glock, it's just it's like I pick it up and it fucking goes off every time. Mm -hmm. And for me, when I'm carrying, that's what I want. I want zero external safeties. Yeah. I want no guesswork. I want to like the pull. And the only thing I'm focusing on is sight picture, the threat, what's around the threat, and then and then neutralizing it. And so that's why I, I shoot Glock. It's yeah. It's like the the Toyota of yeah. Like there's sexier, cooler shit out there, but it's like, yeah, it's a Toyota yeah. Tacoma. That fucking I, thing works. I don't know. I I go back and forth. I like I like staccato. Well, they went from SDI. Now it's staccato, and then I I like fully comped 2011s. Like those are my that's my go to. It's yeah. it, it it runs like a sewing machine. Do you use it's a amazing. compact or full size? Full size. Nice. Like, if I'm gonna shoot for fun, I shoot everything full size, everything comped, everything. It's semi tactical. When I say semi tactical, I agree with the entire philosophy of you have to have a flashlight on everything because I've never met a circumstance where having a flashlight wasn't either directly to your <laughs> yeah. advantage or you didn't really give a shit because it was daylight. So if you need one, you really fucking need one. It also plays a little bit as recoil management. If yeah, you, have that you got all that weight up front. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's it's dual fold, which is I like everything comped and I love to have flashlights on on every pistol I have because it it helps me keep the, the control of the front end and I don't get as much flip and I can drive my split times down a little bit more effectively. So if I'm, you know, inside, we'll call it inside the 10 on an A box, which is roughly, we'll call it 10 to 12 inches. There's just no reason if you have a, a, a really good pistol, you shouldn't be able to get those split times down to like 0.15, which is, you know, 0.15 of a second. And then consistent strings at like 0.15 and just stamp them out. You're fast out the holster, like super fast. I think that's probably why I, uh, I, I you didn't bring my holster yesterday. Well, I'm, I'm traveling up here in Utah, but yeah. you're fast out the, off the holster. That's, 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 that's a good attribute to have. I mean, you've obviously done it. 
lots. Got a few, got a few <laughs> reps in. My favorite days in Afghanistan, my favorite days when we had a day off, this is what I would do. I would, we had a range on the compound. We would, I would go for a run and I would put on my kit. I would have a rifle, load up a bunch of frags and I would go out and I would run and then I would go out to the range, throw a couple frags and then I would shoot like full kit load out. So I'd shoot every drop of ammo that I had essentially on the, on the range. So I'd go from like standing, kneeling prone, standing, yeah. kneeling prone. I'd go from left shoulder, to right shoulder. So I'd switch from, you know, left to right. And then, uh, go from depending. So I, I'd carry the GLM a lot. So the 40 millimeter grenade launcher on the bottom of the, the 416 at that time. So then I'd shoot, you know, 40 millimeter, throw frags, shoot a bunch of five, five, six, empty out all my mags on, uh, you know, if I was carrying a Glock and then, uh, and then I might come back later. And what I do is I would chew through a thousand rounds. Nice. So, if I had the day off and there was nothing that we had to do, I would shoot a thousand rounds. So when you have a yeah. thousand rounds in nine mil, that's a lot in a day. It's yeah. a lot. Like you're smoked. Yeah. So I would start in the morning and yeah, just it's, keep it's, it's by it. like eight, round eight hundred. You're like you're fucking fatigued. Horrible, but, dude. But that horrible. But that's a really good training exercise. I feel like you know I haven't been as vocal on maybe YouTube shit but with that way, but what people forget to understand is they they, they learn these techniques and tactics that look really sexy, but they're not applicable in, in like a real life scenario, M maybe for like the first fucking 15 minutes, mm -hmm. but anybody that's been on a target or, or law enforcement, or like SWAT officer that has actually like cleared buildings and done the shit. Like you realize you get hyper fatigued because your, your endorphins are pumping, your blood pressure's up. You're like, sometimes if you're thinking you're not breathing and you start to like really do different manipulations with your weapon system because you have to. It's not mm -hmm. like you can be stuck out like this with a C clamp with your shoulders high. Right. By the end of it, you're just kind of like, fuck, man. But I think that that's like a, a helpful exercise that you're like, hey, I still have to be mobile, but I also have to put rounds on target. And it changes as far as like how your your body position is, where your the whole thing does. So I think it's important for people to like do that instead of just standing stationary and like rip and steal it fucking 20 yards. Like, ah, that, that works and it's fun. Don't get me wrong. It's but fun. Depends what you're, you're training for. Well now, it, and now I can actually just train for the game. You know, yeah. I can, yeah, I can just like, yeah, yeah. now I don't have to worry about and it. And they just that. fucking steal doesn't shoot back. No, it doesn't. It's awesome. <laughs> like doesn't talk back. doesn't, you know, you just go repaint it. It's, 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 it's going to be a lot of fun. So I, I've always had fun. Like, would I classify myself as a projectile enthusiast? Which is like, it doesn't really matter. I like shooting long range, you know, twenty two rim, uh, you know, archery. It does. It doesn't matter. I mean, we shoot compound bows and back here on the compound because we can. Yeah. I I don't have a range, you know. To, unfortunately, we don't have a you know a pistol range in the Black Rifle Coffee compound here in Salt Lake City, which would be epic if we could but we have an archery range so i can shoot out to 140 yeah. here i feel like and this on the weekends i come in and do it pistol and 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 bow are they, so they are. similar yeah. i mean fucking i don't know if you remember that when dudley came out and he Jeez, went to shoot and i was like all right man let's just see how you're looking before i give you instruction mm -hmm. he's at the 25 yard line he's like king 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 i'm like i don't okay i think you're good yeah. like because that front pin right it's super similar to your front sight post it and is. that's your main focal point but then like your level is your rear sight so i mean like the attribution there is like super similar that guy if we plug that guy into competitive <laughs> shooting crush crush he, he was one of the most naturally gifted pistol shooters I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. Right out of the box. Impressive. I thought he was... I thought he was I, fucking with us. Yeah, so did I. He probably I is. thought he was hustling he's us. He's fucking hustling. I thought he was fucking hustling he's us. He's like, oh, you guys want to bet 20 bucks yeah. on this steel target? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's stretch so. it out to 100. Let's see where we're at. I'm like, you yeah. told me you just picked up a pistol yesterday. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we were... Uh, I had some friends over from Cali and we're sitting at my house and my mom was there and uh, it was just pretty funny. I props to my mom. I had my seven mil out and I put like a target, I put it on Instagram a little bit, but uh, like, it's like an orange steel, you know, silhouette target. I think, it, I think it's somewhere around 300 yards. I haven't completely, it depends where you're shooting, Sure. but I put turf around my pool 
And so like, I got it dialed in, ring it once. I'm like, who's up? My mom just goes, I'll do it. You know, she's my, sorry, mom. I forget my mom's 70, 72. So yeah, 72 years old. She gets in the prone behind my integrally suppressed seven mil from um, SWS. And she just first shot and it stood up and was like, what? Like, damn. <laughs> it was kind of a dope moment. Cause like my mom doesn't have the opportunity to shoot a lot, yeah. even though she used to shoot a lot. And Super cool to see like my mom just Roger up in front of a group of like 15 people and just fucking ring the steel. I was like, that's right. Yeah, that's my blood. She just like dropped the mic and walked away. Just one shot, center mass, ripped it, got up. Um, and I think one of the other guys that shot that day missed it. I just like looking like, bitch, seven year old mom just whooped your ass. <laughs> yeah, we took, uh, we took my dad out a few years ago. Well, no, we were zeroing him for his elk hunt. Logan and I stretched him out. He had mm. this, uh, he had this thirty out six that he bought, maybe nineteen seventy eight, and it would not hold a group at a hundred, oh, not even close. I was just talking to me yesterday about that. Yeah, it, it could not hold a group at a hundred. So I thought it was him. I was like, dude, you don't know how to shoot. Like, let me get behind that gun. Absolutely not him. That that. That rifle, the rifling would, is just completely. The rifle gone. would not hold a group. Yeah. So then we gave him a seeking six five, and he, groups tightened right back up. And then we stretched him out to like seven hundred in fifteen minutes. He was out at seven hundred. Damn, like, bang. Damn. And uh, and that was the farthest he'd ever shot. Well, he shot his elk at two seventy five or something like that. Heart shot, like, straight, nice. straight heart shot, no issues. So if you have a couple competent instructors that can guide somebody in to, depending on the rifle, the system, you know, how you're going to zero 15, 20 minutes, you're going to be on steel. You're going to have everything dialed in. It's just basic fundamentals. I mean, I maybe, maybe not with like long range precision because yeah. it, there's a lot more intricacies associated with wind mm -hmm. and all the other elements, but yeah, like sub 500 and pistol, like out to 25. It's like, it's really yeah. just fundamentals. Yeah. It's like, Pretty easy. What stance, grip, side alignment, sight picture, trigger squeeze, follow through. I still got it. I just it. Still, I got it still, right got it. still got it. You got it. Still, still got, got it. it. <laughs> still got it. The instructor. <laughs> Be aware of what's around her. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's been good. I've been trying to build some like wacky ass guns. I kind of want to do like gun memes that are that are real. So center mass has been helping me out with that. It's been it's gonna be it's gonna be fun. Yeah, aren't you? You were just saying it earlier, you're going to get a FFL for yourself, you and Mason. Yeah. I mean, I think of it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, right. we, there, there, there's stuff that we want to get, you know, I mean, a lot of people that know like ATF regulations and stuff and all the wacky shit that goes on in this country, but you know, they have some like no letter stuff that's not transferable essentially. Right. So like if, if you're not aware of like most people, probably not maybe in the gun industry, but transferable like machine guns, you know, posted in 1986, it's just a supply versus demand thing. And the demand is massively high. And because there is no supply, that's right. anything post 86, like the price year after year after year, just, it's like, it's fucking gold. I mean, it's a precious metal where yeah. some of the things, if you want to get like a 240 Bravo or some style within that, you're looking at hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, like it to the average person, it's impossible. But if you can get it, strictly on an SOT or whatever it you can that make price it, right? goes down to like 10 grand right where it's obtainable at least yeah, yeah. where like yeah it's a lot of fucking money but you know you're not I don't know who has just like $250,000 to just throw at one around. gun for for whatever but I, I would imagine it's a very limited population of people yeah yeah and a lot of them are collectors that's what you find like when you're looking at that because I've had some friends ping me it's like a lot of people that made money back in the day they hold on to them 20 years right probably like an 80 to 120 percent increase on what they paid for it to now and then they kind of sell it off keep what they want and then that goes to like another you know big money guy that owns all of them and it kind of just cycles around the country so it's a it's an investment. That's all it is. Yeah. yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. I've bought a few over the years strictly for an investment. I mean, it it's really impossible for that to ever go down in value in my yeah. eyes. Like, well, there's no way that they're going to reverse. No. Go back to, oh, yeah, you can have a yeah, belt you, fed. You can have a MAG-58. Like, like when, they're, when, when, they're, when they're talking about limiting the actual rounds that you can have in a magazine that yeah. it, versus, you know, yeah, we're, we're going to just open up belt feds for everybody. I mean, that would be pretty sweet. Yeah. But it would also every one of my vehicles would have 
three machine guns on it then, right? You'd have like yeah. front passenger, I'd passenger. have like gunner, and then maybe like the rear seat guy with like a 46 or something. Mm-hmm. What else is going on? What else you got going on? <clears throat> Let's see. You're doing Jody. You're doing your music video. What what so what is this song about? Oh, that one. Yeah, yeah. I uh I took a hiatus. I like I'm weird, you know me. I, I took a hiatus from YouTube just to kind of like reinvigorate what I wanted to do. I think my creative process is you I'm over the game of publishing for the sake of publishing. I want it to be like things that I really enjoy. And I think that other people can't necessarily activate around. Like a lot of people can, they do a better job than me about talking about guns and reviewing. I'm like, like grand thumbs content. Like I would never try to do that content, but it's fucking awesome. Right. Mm-hmm. He's a great dude. Yeah, great yeah. content. Brand hair. The whole, the whole group of, of guys is great. So I kind of like do my thing. Yeah. I have a Jody song, which is Jolene from uh, uh, Dolly Parton. Yeah. Redone in Jody. If you don't know Jody, it's the guy that tries to bang your wife when you're deployed or, or girlfriend. Does. Yeah. Or does. Or, or does. does. Yeah, Jody. And I feel like it might offend a couple of people, which is fine. I like that. Yeah, and yeah. also, I've been Jody before, so it's okay. You know? Yeah. like You have been Jody and you've been Jody. Yeah, yeah. I mean, right. I, 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 yeah, I did whatever I want <laughs> in my <laughs> 20s, man. That was, it was fucking fun. Yeah. Um, no, new shit. A cool thing. I went through the boot campaign. Um, yeah. a, a, a little bit of that. That that was that was cool because I'm sure most people know. I, I send the board of directors the boot campaign Black Rifle Coffee uh, does a literal fuck ton um, for the organization, and we're very thankful for that. Um, yeah, what, so give some context to everybody from um, what what is the boot campaign? What do they do? Sure. Um, they focus on the invisible wounds of war and individualized treatment. And, and what essentially that means is, well, why I'm so a part of it is because of that. You know, I think you and I have seen over the course of the GWAT and post GWAT that it's like, I would say like a bandaid on a bullet hole where you, you, you treat symptoms, not the causation of the root issue and the VA, why I think people are so, you know, pissed off at the VA is because that's a lot what they do. They mm-hmm. come in, you go, I have a headache. They treat you with said drug or opioids and that's just you're masking the problem you're not going to the root issue or people have cognitive function issues whatever the boot campaign you go through and i actually got to go through it a one because i've ignored my health for a very long time b also uh you know i wanted to see the program and and there was a lot of lesson learned learned about my own self and things that like i get frustrated about like my memory for instance i was telling you this like i have severe short-term memory loss but there's ways to like combat that through cognitive therapy but you know if if you don't know that then you're sitting there like am i fucking stupid like i can't remember shit but then once you go through the test and they're like hey dude uh so this tbi this fucking (laughs) explosion that hit you over (laughs) here uh, actually kind of did some shit, you know, and, and let's, let's try to work on it. So it's, it's good to have a path forward for that. And moreover, they do some stuff through like this thing called the Cooper clinic, um, which is a a medical place out in Dallas. And what it is, it's a one-stop shop. So it's like a 10 hour doctor's appointment and you actually get results the day of. So you go in super early. I did two different blood panels. They take blood, they do Mm. Uh, cognitive tests, they do stress tests in your house, your heart, um, CT scans. And so you walk out of that thing at like 6 p.m. and they're like, here's everything right with you, here's everything wrong with you. And it's a little, uh, it's a little gnarly because you know, you find out some shit and you're like, oh, okay, that makes sense to that. And right, but it, it's wonderful because th- they're able to provide that level of care and, and medical, um, help to people that don't have any resources to go get that. Like there's a lot of people out there that are veterans that don't have active like Medicare or anything. They they might have to go through the VA and we know how that turns out half the time. And that's why like really people in need that apply to the program. It's really nice to see them come out the other side. And it was really cool for me to go through it and kind of see everything that they do. Like there's TBI (laughs) studies, there's PTS studies. You can submit your stuff to if you want to be partake in it and it just helps build a case study for more people going forward so we can have more information to like directly correlate your symptoms with the cause and then put you on a on a plan forward to fix what you got going on. So what'd you change? After? Um huh? What'd you change after? Like finding out some some things about maybe your yeah sexuality or whatever. right like, yeah like i like i like i like to fuck in between mattresses and comforters <laughs> it's like a weird, <laughs> weird thing no i i uh relatively fucking healthy i don't need to get into all my shit but um no i think a part of that i've just kind of been proactive in, in, in focusing on myself a little bit like i haven't drank alcohol in over a month and a half it's been great really getting back into fitness and <clears throat> going out and doing hood rat shit you know Go jump out of plane, scuba dive, like fucking live some life. Right. I'm so I'm excited for that. 
Yeah, it's good. I honestly think alcoholism is probably the single most detrimental thing that we as a peer group do to ourselves. Uh, I don't drink anymore at all. Like I, I stopped, I don't know, probably, well, a long time ago. I've never really been a huge drinker to begin with, but like I've gone through phases. But I've seen it amongst our peer group of GWAT veterans, mm-hmm. how it, it ruins their life. Yeah. And they become so dependent on it that they can't function in any way. Like, like not, not only I, w- I would say in a social environment, yeah. but they can't even function. And I've seen it. it so many different ways. And, and to be fair, like we've known each other for a long time. I mean, 10 years, like you and I have seen each other in a lot of different circumstances and yeah. I've seen it like in and around our office for 10 years mm-hmm. and we see it. And it's, it's it's quite literally directly impacted a lot of our friends and business partners. Oh, a hundred percent. And I'm, I'm the first one to admit, and I've never said this publicly. Like I've struggled, like I'm a fucking artist, man. Like I'm an emotional artist, but I have like a very right side business brain and left side creative and whichever one's in control that day takes me over. And, uh, the artist brain, right. It's like, it tells you the wackiest shit. It's just like throw the table. It's fucking cool chug that bottle. Like, and it just, it takes you over because you want to feel and be inspired. And I think that the more high stress, crazy shit you go through in life, that artist side of me chases that feeling and the bar just gets higher and higher and higher to a point where you almost feel numb to things. And then when you feel numb to the, the, the environment around you, the only way to influence yourself creatively or positively is through substance. Mm-hmm. And alcohol has always been that thing for me. And, you know, I've struggled with alcoholism my entire fucking life. Like, and, and my problem was I'm a fucking high, high functioning drinker. Like other people that have alcohol, they wake up and they're drinking. I've never been that guy. Like I hit the gym in the morning. I, I show up on time on target for work, yada, yada, yada. But you know, you find yourself getting into rhythms and habitual forms of drinking, which is like every day at 3 PM. You're like, fuck it. Let's have this. And it's like a Pringles can. Once you pop, you don't stop. And then you're drinking all day, but then I'm still creating and having fun with friends, but then I'm still up at eight in the morning. So it, it's, it's a, it's like masking itself as if it's not an issue. And, you know, I usually would take like a couple weeks off here and there from drinking. And then finally that this, this go around, I'm just like, I just want to see what life's like without that. Mm -hmm. Like, not that, like, not that health influence it necessarily, even though alcohol is poisoning your body, but I just went, let's like, let's go see what it's like to have a clear brain all the time. I'm annoying as fuck because I have so much energy, (laughs) but it's, it's been an eye opener and I didn't realize how much it was affecting certain aspects of my life. Like mainly the physical one, because I I consider myself an athlete, like that's a huge one for me, like recovery. And like, I have alcohol allergies. And so like, I have like, yeah, like my body doesn't do well with it. Like the way I metabolize it. And so like, is that why you get all flush? I can get flush. I get really swollen. Like I get really bad inflammation and like my knee pain has gone down like 50% since there. Like crazy shit where you're just like, yeah. this is my life. I'm, I'm fucking tough. Right. Cause that's right. the ranger mentality or yeah. whoever, you don't even have to be in the military to do that. But like I'm fucking tough. I'll just do it. And that's like stubborn head me. But then you realize you can make your life a little easier and then focus that energy on something more creative or something that is more impactful in your life, like family or friends and, and creating a legacy and all that shit. So I've been pretty stoked. And I, I suggest people that are like on the fence about that stuff, like give it a try. Like, I'm not like, I, like I'll still drink going forward at some point, but I just learned like I can't do the habitual stuff for sure. Yeah, I, I it's think- It's a vicious cycle. I, I honestly, I, I think a lot of people, they just need to try sobriety for- As I drink my crack day. cocaine coffee. I I don't, I, like depending on how you want to classify the chemical release and, and dopamine fixation or however you want to go into it, Caffeine is one of those things where if you understand the chemistry behind what's happening with the brain and then how that's directly impacting your life in a more beneficial way where, yeah, is it an addictive substance? For sure, it is. But it's also igniting your 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 brain and making you, or I should say not making you, it's helping you function at a higher level cognitively. Whereas alcohol doesn't do that for me. It, it directly yeah. slows down everything. It, 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 it contributes to a negative ROI, which would be a negative return on my investment specifically in my life. So, like, you know, I, 
I have basically two things. I have work and family. That's what I have. So I go from the office back home and then I have to plug into my kids and I have to be present. I have to be plugged in and present all the time with everything I do. Very limited time do I even have to myself most of the time. Like yeah. I get like 15, 20 minutes here and there. But if I can steal that from you, that's that's something that I, I really like has has like invigorated my soul again is that when drinking for me, it became like a part of my lifestyle. And and again, I'm not over here preaching like stop drinking. I fucking drink my whole life and I'll definitely like glass of wine and red meat sure. is like my favorite shit ever. But what I realize it's like that time to yourself. It's really hard being in an entrepreneurial position that you and I are and socially and networking and nonprofits, like everybody always wants your time. It, like the second you wake up from your phone and so like finding time for yourself is really difficult. And then when I was drinking, it was just like that, that time to myself wasn't mine. It felt like, but now it's like, fuck, I'll just go out and paddleboard at like 7 PM for 45 minutes. And like, uh, you know, there, there's more positive ways to influence what I need to like sort and defrag my hard drive of my brain to figure mm -hmm. out a plan forward and like problem solve a lot of complex issues in, in personal life and in professional life. And I, I couldn't, I necessarily couldn't do that drinking the amount that I was because you need to have a clear head and all alcohol was doing for me was just putting it off tomorrow. It was like the, you know, you, what you said, why do today? What you can't do tomorrow <laughs> kind of like joke. And it's fucking true. Cause you're like, ah, fuck it. Feel good now. But then those things compound. And then you realize you've left a lot of shit on the table that you at least for me, right? Like I want self-governance. If I, I ha you have to have accountability to be success successful in life. And the less accountability you start to have, then your standards drop. It's like, I want to be like an exceptional person in life and do my fucking best, the best version of me. And drinking every single day at 3 p.m. is is not a contributor to that, that you know, KPI per se. Well, I, and, and I, to be fair or to be honest, like we, we've been in this company for 10 years and there's been a lot of alcohol in this building. Fuck yeah, dude. There's been a lot of there's been a lot of alcohol in this building and it's and it's it was never necessarily discouraged. You know, I mean, one of our previous business partners that was downstairs, he would crack a bottle at noon. And I mean, noon one o'clock, go down to his office and hey, you want a little mm -hmm. a little nip? And you'd have a like an afternoon little cocktail and go back to work or whatever it was. Like yep. It was very specific to the environment, the culture, because, you know, startup coming out of our, you know, the garage into a lawn mowing, you know, we shared, we shared a space with a lawn mowing service and then we bought this building and it's kind of like, Hey man, this, this is, this is our world right. and we can build it however we want. That's actually the really cool thing about the the business is we can build whatever we want and how we want to build it. But, but you build us, like for me, it's like you, you tend, at least me, you, you build like a fake psychological reality. And for me, like, dude, my whole life, like I've had to do events and there's thousands yeah, of yeah. people there and it's a lot, right? And then you want to give every, excuse me, every single person their moment and like a personal moment as best as you can. It's hard for me to do that because like I'm, I'm usually kind of an introvert, but like drinking is always the yeah, one. Yeah. And then you go out to events and people are like, Jameson. Yeah, yeah. And then you almost feel like you're letting people down. And that's really where I was stuck in a position quite a few years ago when it was like really bad when I first started, because you're, you never want to say no. Cause you're like, dude, this dude's like, he bought the shirts. Yeah, he yeah. watches the videos no. and all he wants is that shot of Jameson with you. Cause that's your persona. And I like, I fucking like Jameson. And, that's uh, good. and then, but you do that fucking 15 times a night. And then you're off to the next event the next day and then you're doing it. It's just like compounds and compounds rather than just be like, nah, I'm fucking good. We can have fun without it. You know? Yeah. It's interesting. I don't think a lot of people understand that you're an introvert. They don't. No. Like I think because based on your public persona, your image, they think that you're highly social, you know, but you're not, you're actually super introverted. But that's, what, a, that's you're, but you're actually out of all three, that. out of all three of us, <laughs> yeah. Jared, yeah. You, me, you're the most introverted out of everyone. Yeah, I agree. With yeah, that. it's but that's why I was, you know, alcohol always helped me because it's like, fuck yeah, it, I'm going, yeah. I'm going on the show. Let's go. Yeah, well, you could, uh, you, you, it, 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 what it does, I guess, is it, it essentially numbs that whatever that is because I. Well, the first thing to go away is your 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 not inhibitions, but whatever your you you start to not give a fuck yeah, for whatever the, the scientific way of right, saying that is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But that puts you in a bad position too, because it's like that artist brain too. I'm like, mm. 
nothing really matters. <laughs> and he's like, fuck it. <laughs> like, let's go drive. Let's go flip this fucking ATV. Yeah, I've yeah. done that before. I'm like, hey, yeah. dad, I'm going to flip this. And then I break my foot, flipped it. And he's like, well, I guess you did what you said, son. And you're like, yeah, shit. I was fucking dumb. But it's fun. I don't care. It's, I think that's a natural evolution in life, though. It's like going through those things. I, I wouldn't change it for the world, but then I think that there's just like a different path going forward for me that's going to be super exciting and fun and yeah. rowdy. How old do you know? 36. Yeah. So you're at the same age that I was when I start when I mean when I started this, like yeah. literally 36. It was 10 years ago. I'm 46 now. Yeah. Uh, it seems like a long time ago. It does. <clears throat> I mean, 10 years. Yeah, dude. I was looking back on just how much I personally aged, just my <laughs> my hair. I know, dude. Like it's crazy. Like I'm gray. Yeah. You know, two kids. So it's, you know, two kids, you know, a business, uh, you know, 900 employees or whatever it is that we're, we're at, you know, uh, fucking internet hate and all the like, yeah. you know, drama associated with this, which, you know, I, the, the older I get, the more time in the saddle, the less it truly affects me. You know, I, at times you're like, ah, oh, man, I can't believe it. Really? Is this, is this what we're going to do now? Internet? You know, like, it kind of irritates can me. I, can I have Sunday off yeah, to chill let's, with let's, my let's life, have, dog? Let's have, yeah, let's have a day off of this, <laughs> right? You fucking morons. Like, but you're the only one that can, like, create that environment, right? But, yeah. And I think it's, you know, the the 10 years of, like, just grinding, like, just grinding, man. Like, I think there's a perception at times that, like, for you and I, and maybe there's an outward perception that we've just been so successful and it's been easy I, and maybe maybe there isn't i i don't know i think it definitely like like a lot of what i would say is like the the hate and misconception has been built on the fact that people have seen that we've been successful and it's like mm -hmm. i'm gonna take something from those guys and but i feel like that's the like the the evolution of every business and or entertainer i mean it's like the whole you die a hero live long enough become the villain yeah that's true and and i think that there's just coach, cultural cultural shifts that happen that you know just certain audiences and certain things go bad i mean you look at any artist like it's really hard to like be the fucking guy it's hard i mean like maybe there's like eminem or something but even him when he got into politics he got raked across the coals and you, you, it just goes, it just happens. It's kind of part of life. It's a cycle. Yeah, right? it's, it's a wave, right? It's, it's a it goes up and down. And yeah, that that's the funny thing with this is is you know it's there's highs and lows, right? So you know, my wife and I talk about this quite a bit. Where super high, super low, and depending on the day, depending on your wins or your losses, and it's a batting average over time. And you know, for me, I, I think the one thing that we've had over the last 10 years is, you know, you, me, and Jared, we're still friends. Like, it's just super impressive. It is crazy. I think we're one of the very few. <laughs> we are like, I mean, admit, we, admittedly, there's been a large churn of other, you know, associated people over the years. I mean, for better, for worse, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's something to really hang your hat on. You know, yeah. and, it, and it's a testament, I think, of character and the character that we saw in the authenticity early was like whatever the Internet says about you, like you're, you're not you're not a liar. You're not a cheat. You, you try to be an honest man. You take care of people. You're a raging asshole sometimes. But I like yeah. that about you. Um, but like you're like a fucking good dude. And, and that's it's easy to have long term relationships with people that are good dudes. Like we all have our quirks. Right. But like you've never been like. I never, like you're not stealing, you're not, you know, no, no, it's just like, it's fucking easy. Cause you're not like, did you just did what dude? You, you took a million dollars out of what, you know, like you've never done that. Like not even close. And so it, it, that it's, 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 it's something that I think we often undervalue about the position that this company has been able to do, not only from a partner standpoint, but allowing us to create the cultural environment that we've had. Like, I truly believe with my brain and what I think I wanted to do with life, if I didn't have this and to walk around this fucking company and talk to different, a ranger and a Marsoc guy or a National Guard gal yeah. or whoever, right? Like that shit fucking inspires me every day because I'm around my fucking people. Like yeah, it's, yeah. it's awesome. And I have to remind myself of that all the time because mm -hmm. it can look pretty fucking lonely if you don't have that, especially for a fucking intense person like you and I. Like, 
sitting at home, not being, I, I, I've been, to, you've been to LA and the meetings we have yeah, to go yeah. to sometimes you're like, oh my God, I can't do it here. And it's like, part of me is sad that people have to live in that. But then the other part of me is super happy because we've created an environment, hopefully that we can continue to scale and scale and scale and provide the opportunity for people that need that cultural environment to come on over and like, yeah, you can say fuck and we're going to work really fucking hard, but we're going to have some fun with it too. And it's a really good mission, you know? Yeah. It's, and it's like, to that point, <clears throat> it's, it's like, I'm not going to change. Like, like, you know, it's so funny, man, because like, you know, I obviously hear it. We were talking to that dude yesterday that we were shooting with, and he's like, yeah, well, you oh. know, this whole butt fucking thing. I'm like, yeah, man. Like, I say really fucked up stuff. I do. Yeah, you know why? Humor. You know why? Because at the end of the day, I'm a I'm a knuckle dragger, like regular dude that says really fucked up stuff, <laughs> yeah. just like everybody else that I hang out with, just like you, just like all of my other... Yeah. Like, my friends, it's, it's a really good, it's a really good example. It's like, like, my brother-in-law and I were hanging out. He's just, he's like four, he's three years younger than I am, right? He's, he's uh, 43. We were hanging out. We were, we, we went out to the masters like early on in the year, really fucking super fun guy works in banking, like in, in like the corporate world, but his humor is the same. So you can take all of these different jokes that we say and the things yep. that we say, and this is the yep. world that we live in, right? It's like when you say something and all of us are kind of in this this uh, I, uh, this world where everything has to be so PC, so politically correct. And it's like yeah. when you're hanging with your buddies and when you're saying r the things that we say, and oh, by the way, everybody says them, yeah. it doesn't matter whether or not you're like hanging out with, you know, your dad or your uncle or whomever it is, like, this is the humor that I've literally grown up in my entire yeah. life. And now yeah. the expectation is that I'm not going to communicate like that anymore because somebody might get offended. I got news for you. Fuck off. Yeah. I, Don't I, care. I think Jared, JT said it really well too. He goes like, someone was bringing it up and they, I think they, they matched something like, well, you know, you just got to be careful. And JT was just like, imagine a Friday night with five of your closest best friends someone records that and puts it out and they're like, oh, fuck. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah. feel that? Feel yeah, it. Because yeah, because everyone's full of shit. Everybody has their own little like subculture that goes and says hyper aggressive stuff, whatever fucking side whatever. of the world you're on, but they're out there just slaying bodies verbally, but they hide behind that virtue signaling platform of fucking bullshit. And, and then once you realize that, it's like, oh, I don't fucking care. Like- when and, and once you Who realize yeah, yeah, it's that great. it's a game for people to to squeeze yeah, money out yeah, of you, yeah. like fun. once you realize it's a game for you to squeeze money out of people, because it's, what they'll yeah. do is they'll take whatever you say, it's real warfare. and then they'll they'll hire an attorney, and they might it, they don't need, like by the way, just so everybody's like welcome to reality, they don't be they 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 don't have to prove anything, no. so they can just make up a bunch of shit and be like, hey, this is what's happening. You're like, hey, man. Here's the deal. I, I, I mean, the, very the biggest loving... case in the world right now is Trump. Yes. Look what's happening. You can yes. say and do all this psycho shit and you know it's all fucking bullshit within reason. It doesn't and it's matter. Like, but it doesn't matter doesn't because matter. the tabloid exists. The tabloid. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, the, it's imagine like, like a world. And now what I, what I realize is what the world that, we've li that we live in, it's divided into two camps. What, what, what I what I realize is like there are people that have a sense of humor that can take a joke, yeah, and there are people that can't, and it doesn't matter whether or yeah. not you're a liberal or conservative because we have them both on both sides. It do, it doesn't have anything to do with politics. Yeah, you can either take a joke or you can't. This whole society that we're living in and this entire conversation around around what offends me and how, well, you can be just as offended because what happens on, on the conservative right is like people get offended because they're like, I can't believe you would say something like that. And then on the left, they're like, I just can't believe you'd say something like that, right? So I'm using both, both voices. They're both so offended because they're humorless morons depending on how much offense they're gonna take based on it. And it's like, hey, guess what? Newsflash, don't fucking care. You're all going to get offended by me because I say horrible shit all the time. I'm a CEO of a company. Guess what? I'm not going to change. I'm still going to say like, yeah. weird, crazy shit every now and again because I'm yeah. a human. 
I live yeah. in the reality. Like, like we live in a universe of, you know, we're flying through these fucking, we're flying through this abyss on these tiny little rocks. And Fuck yeah, space stuff. Like, I'm in now. It, it, on these tiny little rocks. <laughs> yeah. Like we're, we're essentially like one step of uh, away from being like the equivalent of fungi. Yeah. And now what you want to do is you want to put a, a, an arbitrary set of rules on top of me and the way that I communicate, which essentially is just these like vibrations that come out of my fucking head. Yeah. It's, uh, and yeah. you're going to be offended by these vibrations that come out of my fucking head. Yeah. I'm like, nah, I'm okay. I'm all good. Yeah. So guess what? Don't care. Get offended. I'm fine with it. Because at the end of the day, I get to walk into this company and I have, I don't know, what, 150 people that live here and work in Salt Lake and I can high five and I can still make a joke. Yeah. People aren't going to get offended and we can talk about like you and I can have conversations in the conference room that has George Washington crossing the Delaware. Like our conference room in Salt Lake city has George Washington crossing the Delaware to go shoot British people in the face on Christmas. America. And it's like, yeah, that that's cool. We that's we awesome. have we have Declaration of Independence well, I, on, on our you, wall. You, we have we have Washington yeah. <laughs> accepting. Yeah, we were like, talking about that yesterday, right? Yeah. Where it's like it's it's fucking pretty funny that we live in such a like woke society that having that mural and then proudly displaying an American flag is like influences massive amounts of hatred towards our company from like the far left because they're like it's a fair American flag. Yeah, and yeah. for me, it's just like. I don't even think about it. I'm like, I just really like the colors and it like, it stands for, it's been side by side in everything I've done since I was a little child. And I saw my dad's American flag. He put up every single morning and take it down every single night. And it's a part of like my fucking DNA and the opportunities that have been provided to me. And for me, it's such a bizarre concept, but the good, not necessarily good part about that, but the, it, we, we just double down on it. Like, it's like, I believe in it through every fucking cell of my body that this is the greatest country and the opportunities it's provided me so much that I went to fucking war for nearly 10 years for it. And then I'm trying to dedicate my entire life to it. So it's like, that's how much I believe in it. It's the action behind it. And you know, no, nobody's perfect, but if you fucking disagree that you fuck you, it's just like, you're fucking fuck you. We're, we still get to work in a place where we, we have a flag in front of every one of our coffee shops, 30 plus coffee shops. We have a flag in front of our building. We have a copy of the Declaration of Independence as you walk down the hall in our corporate headquarters. We have Washington crossing the Delaware. We have we have the British surrendering. I have a, I have I a still, piece of art of the British surrendering. <laughs> yeah. Like, so this is still okay for me. It's like, you know what, man, this is this is part of our country. And the fact that that people can try and pull that apart and say all the negative hysteria around, you know, our founding fathers, whomever it is. And it's like, I used to tell this to people all the time. It's like, who is your, your entrepreneurial inspiration? And I was like, you know, Washington, man, he was a startup guy. Mm -hmm. Washington was the single most influential in like, like he was the hinge pin to the entire the entire American, America as we know it today, the entire country, he was the hinge pin. Without that guy, nothing that we have today would exist without him. And the fact that people can say all the, 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 the negative hysteria directly around what he was doing, whether it was like, whether he had slaves or he didn't have, like he didn't have slaves or whatever the, the information is out there, the fact that he existed a couple hundred years ago, and he put in place what we have today. It is so important for us to respect the fact that that's what he and the founding fathers did. I'm not going to take that down off my wall because somebody takes offense to it. It's like, great, yeah. go find another fucking place to work. Go find another place to buy your coffee from. That's okay. But the last fucking thing we're going to do in our company is put a picture of like Che Guevara on our wall, which is what most coffee companies in America would. And they, cause they'd be yeah. like, oh, he was a revolutionary. Yeah. He was a psychopathic communist murderer that spent the majority of his adult life, essentially uh, intimidating people into a dictatorship. Yeah. Well, and I think it boils down to this, right? Like if, if you today have the energy to participate in frivolous drama, mm -hmm. 
You should be so fucking thankful about your environment. I do it. You do it. Everyone probably in America does it. But we have the opportunity to do that because our soul necessities are met. We have oxygen, water, food, all those things. There are so many people out there that don't have that. And so like for people to discredit and talk shit on the history that provided us here and it has been massively imperfect, like definitely not perfect, right? It's, it's full of shit again, because it's like you're sitting on your fucking pedestal in your air conditioned house overlooking a beach doing commentary <laughs> of hundreds of years. You're full of fucking shit. And if you're not, go be courageous and try to change it or whatever. But like, you know, it, it, they're full of shit. I, I keep saying that, but it's, it's, it's hyper annoying to me when people like we all are like critical of, of things that have happened in the past and what we want to go on in the future. But we're, we're pretty fucking lucky. Like, yeah, like really lucky. We're super lucky. <laughs> like, like we won, we won the fucking lottery. Yeah, like when we were lottery, born here, like I love it. When, when we were just born here, we went, we, we won the lottery, and you know we could have been depending on how things you know shook up, like you could have been born in you know Iraq or you know Syria or Saudi Arabia or it, 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 name the name the country. Like we hit the lottery, and like. It, it's so interesting to me as we start to look at the the future of this country and how I, I, I'm reading uh, Stephen Ambrose's book, uh, D Day. I, I started it before in, before D Day actually in June, and just the fact like I, I've been thinking about this so much now because um, you know I, I went through the some of the books on the the Marshall Islands and the Philippines that what the Marines went through. And then what the World War II vets went through yeah. taking Normandy so and this, this, this narrative that is spun by typically one section of our country, whether it's, I think it's mainly the left when they talk about how uh, we didn't need to do some of the things or America didn't need to do some of the things that we did. Well, I've, 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 I mean, it's, it's interesting when you, when you look at it, it's like, you didn't need Good to on. drop the atom bomb. Um, you know, we, we didn't drop the atom bomb in Europe because those were white people over there. And actually, oh, like, they, they have no context of history because Truman was considering it. But because they opened up... O Okinawa was essentially the test bed for an invasion of fucking Japan. Mm -hmm. And we lost so many people and got so fucked up. They're like, oh. <laughs> yeah. The, the casualty estimates associated with how they were going to have to take Japan. In the millions it, or something? It was, it was insane. It was, they didn't have enough men. It, yeah. They didn't have enough men. And that, Hitler, I don't care what side you're on. That's just a hard fucking call to make as like a new, like, we're going to bomb a bunch of civilians. Well, <laughs> I mean, well, I guess Eisenhower, not. It's a numbers game, in, unfortunately. In, you know, and Eisenhower, um, when he was... He, he he was debating it and there's like I there's a there's a whole context around what and how they were debating the invasion of Europe and when they were going to invade and then how they were going to invade and and they knew that it wasn't a guarantee that they were going to get in on when they when they D-Day and Normandy, they weren't positive and they almost didn't. They brought the battleships in so close that they were essentially shooting cannons at point blank mm -hmm. onto the shore of Normandy, like running their ships aground, trying to penetrate the 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 iron curtain, essentially. Well, that, that would be the Soviet Union, but essentially penetrate the beach. But we lost so many people. In some circumstances, you were losing entire ships mm -hmm. of guys that were trying to get onto the beach to unfathomable, land unfathomable to be honest, to be honest and, yeah. and then you have an an entire airborne operation which like, like fucking shit show like just a complete shit show the the fact that they pulled that off and the the sacrifices that were made just and on, the fucking on that like day alone. The, just the like the elephant sized cojones it takes to be like an 82nd airborne or 101st and be like, yeah, I'm gonna get on this glider and fucking I'm gonna get on this, this bitch fucking, like in the middle of nowhere with a clacker to hope I know who the yeah. enemy and who the friend like. Oh man, that's it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's, it's crazy. Gnarly. And yeah. 
these guys were all, uh, Eisenhower said that uh, he was like, most combat circumstances, it's really hard to find people to sign up in Normandy. We had more people, we had more people that wanted to go than we had room for. Really? Yeah, because they were, it was so important for us to be able to take down, obviously, the, the Nazi regime. And it was so meaningful that not one person that participated from his perspective in D-Day would have ever regretted it, which was a totally different psychological response to some of what I would call the low intensity conflict that came in later from Vietnam and some of the other conflicts that we were in, but, but low, low these, intensity and then the, yeah, in, 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 the, in yeah, correlation to world war two for sure. Look at this thing. So this thing is it's good. Sweet. Even though they miss misspelled your name. That's okay. Whoever made this? who made this, you know, or whoever made it. Thank you. But you yeah. misspelled my name. It's fucked up, man. Where's that at? He, two, he two teed me. He two teed me. Two teed. It's okay. It's fucking There's awesome. There's a note right here. Let's see. Oh, I dude, I get a shirt yet. too. I haven't read it yet. Okay. Veteran owned and operated. All right. Compadre. Oh, this is cool. Look at that. Matt. Design. We met at Shot Show and drank some beers at the Circle Bar. I told you that we would love to gold plate your Glock oh. and engrave it. With scroll works, you nice. said that you were down. Fuck and yeah! You would ship us this slide from your Glock. I asked mm -hmm. how we could reach you, trying to get your contact information, and you said to message you on Instagram. Nice. You never opened up your DM. Oh damn, he's spicy <laughs> with me. <laughs> we are still down though. Te mando un beso yeah. y sabes un donde. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I'll get back to you, Jesus. Oh, it's Chewy. All right. That's just cool, CCF though. tactical. All right. Well, yeah, I'm yeah. gonna put. I'll wrap your shirt here for a second. Oh, you know? fuck yeah! Nips out, suns out, oh, guns out. Yeah. Oh. Oh God. Man, that's Let's hot. Let's go. That's hot. Is that? Oh yeah. There you go. Look at that, dude. Do CCF. I look swollen up? Do I look swollen up? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah that looks good. Random fact: I learned how to scream for a new song. I just learned how to. Do oh, it. you had to learn how to scream. Learning how to fry scream is pretty challenging. How to what? It's called a fry scream when you do that like that. What's a fry scream? I don't have that. No it's idea like what a it technical is. music term for is just like yelling loud. Huh. Yeah. It's like, like how did Danny Warsnop tell you how to do it? <clears throat> he actually uh oh, yeah, I'll say this word. Danny called me the other day. He he actually went to a, a screaming coach and like learned how to properly scream. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you have one of the most brutal screams in like metal core metal yeah, yeah. of all time. And he's like, Well, I was always doing it wrong, but their new set list on Asking Alexandra, their tour starts actually in San Antonio, the 30th of August this month. Um, and they're doing like a whole set list of all their old shit to include their new stuff. Really? So if you're an Asking Alexandra fan, go fucking check that out because it's going to be like an awesome show. It's all their old hits combined with their new hits. What do you, what do you listen to right now? Me? What's your, what's your what, yeah. Dude, I have musical Tourette's. You know that. Yeah, but what do you listen to? Like what what would you listen to this morning? Really? Yeah. So, like, I drove to the gym listening to some Morgan Wallen, mm -hmm. um, and then I put, like, I think Hank Williams Jr. was on that playlist as well. So, okay. country. Got there. Uh, I was in a hip-hop mood today, so I was listening to some, like, white rapper from Russia back in the day called cool. Blank. And then I did a lot of metalcore. I do that a lot. A lot of, like, you know, a lot of bless. Yeah, yeah. Um, some gangster rap, you know, throwing some Dre in there, maybe some Drake. I don't know. Sweet. I'm all over the place. If it's hype music, that's what I do. Yeah, yeah. And I'm weird. Like, it depends on what muscle group I'm doing. Like, if I'm boxing, it's got to be hip-hop because you have to have the beat. Right. If it's a single lift, like, for strength, if I'm doing, like, heavy deadlifts, it's brutal, brutal deathcore. Huh. There's this guy called Alex the Terrible. Yeah. You should check him out. He he has a scream that's not human. Like, if you heard it in the woods, you would think that it's... it's like Bigfoot or something? Yeah, Bigfoot fucking another Bigfoot uh, <laughs> getting like a, you know, a, a, a burnt tattoo. But yeah, it's like, it's I can't even explain it. Their band's awesome. What is it called? His name's Alex the Terrible. I think okay. uh, there is like Slaughter to Prevail, I believe mm. their band is. I, while you tell a story, I should pull up um, for the audience yeah, to yeah, his listen because it is absolutely insane. I think this um, this this is a Yeti double wall tumbler but it's an m18 smoke red all you have to do is scratch that t off and you're good you oh yeah we're gonna be fine tea. i i i think i, I think, was, I think I chewy like, did it on purpose that's I what think, happened i think what we're gonna do is we're gonna do like 30 of these 
and just give them out to podcast listeners because I th- I love them. I think they're really fucking cool looking. No, they're awesome. It's like right. a smoke raid, the distress stuff around there. Well, it's fucking awesome. Um, let me see if I can get it here. Listen to this. Okay. Um, wake up, took a shower, and right now I got to warm up my vocal cords. So yeah, take a second. Um, It's like, how, how does that come out of a human? That doesn't sound like a human being. No, it doesn't. It sounds like some type of a beast. Yeah. Like a, like a man beast. I feel like if his band, it's huge right now, but if if, if they, you know, cease to uh, keep selling shows, he could just do like ADR sounds for horror movies, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Fucking. So is it a big band? Yeah, they've, they've come on the scene in like the last year. Okay. Just li- literally because of that guy. They make good They make good music though. It's not your style. What's your, uh, what do you mean? What it's it's, not, my it's not everybody's listen. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's like, yeah, it's heavy. Okay. Yeah. Does your wife listen to music? I think she's stuck on her playlist from like 2010, you know? Yeah. It's a lot of, she loves 80s music like Bon Jovi, Journey. Huh. That's like her, that's her go-to. I've corrupted her a little bit and got her on like, she like Alan Jackson. So she's like a lot, lot of 90s country, which I, I fuck with. That's mm-hmm. fine. And Dude, Hank William Jenner and my new skid steer is the most amazing thing ever. Chopping, like using my drum shredder on cedars and just, it's just amazing. You mean- It's a family listen. tradition. Just like, yeah, yeah buddy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I finally pulled the trigger on a skid steer, dude. It's like, I think you have one, right? They're fucking expensive, dude. God. I have um, I have a mini excavator too. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because I am um, my property in Idaho. I have um, a hundred, hundred acres, give or take a couple up there. And, um, I go up there and I'm putting a couple cabins on it and I've got, I just put a well in. So I've got oh, really? well water. Yeah. How far did you have to drill? And like, uh, it's like 180 feet. So not too bad. Ways. Yeah, yeah. A lot, and but not, not like terrible. Like pressure's great. I'm going to put it in a water tower so I can pressurize the entire property up there. And then basically I, at the, you know, at the core of what I do, I'm I'm constantly preparing for the worst and hoping mm-hmm. for the best. So at the end of the day, I can have a fallback position in the middle of nowhere that uh, it might or might not be easy to, to to defend, right? Depending on the circumstance, but it's got to be off the beaten path. And um, you know, I've got a couple of ponds up there that are naturally uh, reoccurring seasonally. Yeah, and then so I've got fish ponds like skid steer, mini axe, like I've been logging it. So uh, I've been that's, taking- That's a, like the big one. It's like shelter, food and water, mm-hmm. sustainable, yeah. and then some form of isolation. So the bleed over of yeah. like cities and that, that that doesn't get it. That's that's kind of what I, my thought process is too. Well, my kids are, my kids love it up there. Like my, you know, my kids love it up there. They they were just, my wife was up in uh, upstate New York, which is where her family, like her- grandparents and things like that where they're from out in the middle of fucking nowhere like rural upstate new york and i heard it's really beautiful up there it's amazing yeah yeah and they were swimming in you know the lakes and it's like 65 70 degrees whereas out west even up north in you know idaho and montana it's like 100 degrees right now so you go northeast it's 70 75 there's a ton of water. There's, you know, deer everywhere. It's, it's actually beautiful. I didn't get to go this year because I had a ton of work I had to do, unfortunately. It's the uh, nature of the beast. Are you, um, we got a little time. So are you, what, what do you got? You got uh, hunts this year, right? So yeah, I am. I'll tee you up. So I was every year um, and you know what? Fuck you, all you like, you know, like, oh, high fence this, whatever. Yeah. I, 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 I high fence hunt it once a year. I go big. Yeah. Go big. A little big. But um, this year I took some friends out, and what we do is we kind of have this, like, collective group that pitches in, and we just go kill shit. And then we have, I think we got 1,000 pounds of meat 
out of the, the whole thing. It was mm -hmm. gnarly, but we kind of give that to everybody. So we got a bison, a water buffalo. The water buffalo is interesting because uh, it, little, little, little known fact, if you're a uh, high fence hunting, if, if animals have defective traits, as far as like this one, the horn yeah, had yeah. broken off and it's not like an antler, so right. it doesn't grow back. So it's the single horn. Gone. I'm like, Hey man, like, uh, what's that? He's like, Oh fucking no, we just need to get, you know, like it wasn't a breeder one. Right, right. It was so, I mean, I got it for like pennies on the dollar where I went, which is cool. Um, got me, a um, a Neil guy. I've never shot a Neil guy before. So that's awesome. Awesome. Delicious. Eating. Delicious. Yeah. And then an axis, which is arguably my favorite, um, right, to eat. Yeah. So end of this year, hunting season is, I don't know, month, month and a half away. Yeah. Which, which you close. got? So I got, uh, Utah elk. Are you going up there? Yeah. Do I have a tag up there this year? Yeah. I mean, I think we have. Like we we have a few that are assigned to the the company here, and then I've got Colorado elk, and I've got okay. California elk. So oh shit, elk elk elk, basically all of September. And the Joe Rogan diet. Yeah, <laughs> well, I, I I I really enjoy elk hunting. I and it's I grew up doing this. So by the way, it's not something that like you know because of the Rogan podcast, it changed my life. And now I'm like, you know, an elk guy. It's like, I, but I, Rogan's into some, like the, he has really good taste in things. He does. And elk hunting is arguably it's one of the most super visceral, fun. crazy, cool yeah. experiences. Yeah. And it's, yes, it's delicious. All of those things are, you know, factual. Like the, the meat is delicious. It's, it's a lot of fun. I truly enjoy archery hunting in the fall because when they're in the rut you can get really fucking close it's it's an incredible experience and then you know subsequently i'll go out with a rifle later on in the year and do a couple cow hunts yeah. we do wild game barbecues uh, you know that but for the people that don't don't uh know we do wild game barbecues here at the salt lake city facility yesterday was every elk, week elk tacos yeah yeah yesterday was elk Charles tacos. got so offended i walked by his office yeah. and he goes Hey man, the fuck you didn't have elk tacos? It's like, dude, we left. We didn't get back till mm -hmm. six p.m. to the office. So, yeah. but yeah. So it's part of the whole thing. We got to like one hunting, just in general. Like you know, not to get on some type of political soapbox, but it's like we building a culture in a company, really reinforcing the fact, like you know, if you're a meat eater, I I, I think one you you can't be anti-hunting. Like if you're a meat eater, you can't be anti-hunting, period. It's too hypocritical. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. It, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, and then as a company building culture around being outside, harvesting your own meat, uh, you know, trophy hunting, uh, what people don't, oftentimes they don't think about, especially the people that like to like, you know, go out on trails and just hike and take pictures. They don't realize that most of their trails yeah. and most of what they're doing from a recreational perspective, being having access to the outdoors is all paid for by hunters and fishermen. Uh, most I mean, even if you look at Africa, you can tell when mm -hmm. you're traveling around some of these villages, which villages have hunting and which don't, because the ones that have hunting tend to be mm -hmm. like massively prolific with, you know, money and water wells and, and like a livable circumstance where the other ones don't. I mean, that's some, I've never been to Africa, but I had a friend out there saying it's like the drastic difference. Like you pull in, you're like, oh, there's no hunting operation here. Mm -hmm. But the ones that do, it's like everybody's happy. They're eating and drinking, supposedly. I'm speaking yeah, yeah. through third party, but. I, I think that's fairly accurate depending on the, the place. Like I spent a lot of time in Botswana and I mean, one, beautiful. Two, there's, I would say, a uh, substantial amount of infrastructure. You know, the, the British were, were, there for i think multiple decades uh, well probably 100 plus years um and then hunting itself is encouraged not obviously the endangered species but hunting is encouraged across the board so uh it's a beautiful country the okavango delta is amazing it's incredible i haven't been to it too many places what i would say is like outside of botswana senegal south africa um I, I'm going to Ethiopia this year on a coffee trip. So sweet. Yeah, we'll go out there. I'm gonna hit you with a random one. Hit it. So as the CEO of Black Rifle Coffee, currently, obviously, um, like where wh where do you see like the company's trajectory in the next five years? Like, what are the things you're kind of excited about to like growth opportunities, hiring opportunities, philanthropic opportunities? Like, wh where where like what what gets like 
Like when you wake up at fucking your whack ass stupid fucking four thirty in the morning, you jocko motherfucker. Oh, I don't do that. I don't do that anymore. <laughs> okay. I can't. Like, <laughs> well, you get up early. I, yeah. Uh, I, get, I, well, I mean, like, but, but like, what, like what gets 6:30. you going? Okay, six thirty. You up yeah. there? You pour that I espresso mean, shot. Like, what? What fucking gets you going right now to be like, I'm still in it. I'm still in the fight. Yeah, I think I think there's a combination of things. Like, I love. Well, one, we just won a golden bean, which is yeah. Talk about that. That's a huge. Uh, accomplishment. There's very few companies, definitely very few coffee companies that actually win a golden bean. And we won it in the most difficult category that you can win. So we, the elite, the elite category to win a gold medal in the golden bean is, which is what a, a quality of taste, correct? Correct. Yeah. So that means that we've, uh, against all, uh, well, the, the coffee companies that submitted, which I would argue are the best roasters in the United States that submit, coffees to the golden bean we won the most elite category which which Edwin, was e, our ecs exclusive coffee club subscription yeah, so and they, circus bear correct correct yeah so circus bear uh you know edwin and i've worked on that for 10 years you know I, well i shouldn't say 10 years i mean that that coffee came in four or five years after we started the company it was named after one of my buddies that we worked with at the cia because that was his call sign uh i just thought the the call sign was awesome. The yeah. design was awesome. And we we wanted to take it to, you know, let's say thirteen to fifteen dollar a pound green coffee. Like that's before you that's, roast it. Yeah. It's it's a really expensive green coffee. It's an incredible coffee. It tastes in I mean it's it's, it's taste is obviously it's it well, I mean it's a gold medal in the elite. <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> it, it it is a big deal, I think. You know, a lot of people don't realize how long I've been roasting coffee, how much love yeah. and passion that I have for the product itself. Um, I get really excited around developing the new products that we, you know, like I love curating products for customers. I love being able to connect directly with the customers. So this podcast is a good example. Like this is the way that I like to communicate to tens of thousands of customers, right? And now I get to plug in, develop products for them. And my entire job is to to try and put the ecosystem of the company and the ecosystem of the cu customer and put those things t together in a way that makes everybody's life better. So it's like if we have a great, positive, you know, directly beneficial culture here at Black Rifle, how do we make products? How do we curate products? How do we develop things that are ultimately going to enhance the customer's life? And then how do we tie all that stuff together between shareholder, uh, company values, yeah. product values, and then how do we tie that back into philanthropic give back positions? Like, like this is a big deal. Like, like it's, it's, I don't think, and obviously I, I don't have access to every business that's ever been established, but I don't think any business has taken on the, the type of charter that we have. <laughs> I just don't like, you know, we're, we're a bunch of, you know, former mill guys that started a company that's now publicly traded that has the opportunity to give millions of dollars back, which we do every year. It's a benefits corp. A lot of people don't necessarily understand that. Because yeah, what, is that, what our, does that mean? Because I mean, I, yeah. Uh, we have an ethical and, I mean, a chartered responsibility to give back a portion of our, pro our profits to veteran-related causes. So benefits corporation is just... It, you 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 have to consider that we can consider that within uh the way that we do our business yeah, there's third party we, oversight correct yeah yeah and uh, a lot of people i don't think they understand that uh, last year we were at three and a half million dollars which three and a half million dollars is is give back just philanthropic give yeah. back and most of that was through cash to 501 uh well nonprofits or directly to um, funds and nonprofits that support veteran and first responder activities. So some of it's in conservation, depending on. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of that was directed towards conservation that was also around hunting and fishing. So we're very specific, not just to any conservation. It's got to be around hunting and fishing. Yeah, which is directly correlated yeah. a lot of the other, you know, veteran philanthropic endeavors yeah. that, you know, take people out and do that kind of stuff. So, so I mean, that fires That's me cool. up, man. Like, I love giving, I love giving back. Um, you know, the millions of dollars that we give back, like you can see them directly impacting people's lives. Uh, you know, 
I think it's interesting how we give back more money than uh, what I would say is what, what, what some of our competitor hate that's driven is from companies that don't even drive as much revenue as we give back every year. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's way more than you and I make collectively from this company. So <laughs> like it's about 10 X to what you and I actually make out of this, like annually from our compensation, which is, I mean, it's open to the public. People can figure out exactly how much we make. So, you know, for us to do close to $400 million this year and for us to give back more money than, you know, some of these companies out there that that's part of their charter. And it's something that they not only advertise, you know, Patagonia, it says 1% of profit is given back to conservation every year. Well, 1% 1% of profit? Well, profit, profit is an arbitrary number, right? Like, yeah. you, can, you can, I mean, you can hide shit in the balance sheet. You can well, if like, you don't, if you, yeah, if you don't you make a profit, you, know. you don't donate any money. So well, it reads well on paper. Yeah, you know? it reads, yeah, it reads well for advertising. It does great for what I would say is, is a uh, lip service. But what I, what I tell people and what we've always told people is it's, it's not PR. It's who we are. It's what we do. Those are the things that fire me up. And espresso, of course. Mm -hmm. And espresso. Matt, I know you got to go. Yeah. Thanks, buddy. Fuck yeah, dude. Later, guys.